We're still waiting to find that Earth-sized world orbiting around a sun-like star in the habitable zone. That's probably still a decade away. But astronomers have found planets orbiting around red dwarf stars in the habitable zone. And so the question is, are they habitable under that dim red light that's falling on them? Well, uh, my guest today has checked and has done a bunch of experiments with cyanobacteria, what else, in a simulated red dwarf environment with the right kind of photons that you would expect to see. His name is Mariano Batistuzzi, and he has tested out how well cyanobacteria handles living on a red dwarf star. And the answer may surprise you. Uh, you know, cyanobacteria, like nothing surprises me about cyanobacteria at this point. Anyway, it's a fascinating conversation. Here's the interview. How bad are red dwarf stars when it comes to life? Well, uh, it's a tough question. And I'm not even sure I'm the best person to ask that since I'm not an astrophysicist, but a biologist, but I will try to, to give you some hints. So uh, it's quite tough because uh, uh, for what I've read, at least uh, in the early stages of uh, a red dwarf uh, life, uh, there are a lot of uh, UVs and X-rays uh, coming out from the stars and reaching and reaching potential exoplanets orbiting uh, orbiting the star. So that's that's a primary problem because uh, um, you could have the stripping of the atmosphere which is being created in those exoplanets and so you could lose the the habitability. And so that that's one problem. Then uh, you have uh, the characteristics of the star so you have uh, this low luminosity, uh, which means that uh, you have to be really close to the star uh, to be in the habitable zone. So the distance from the star to the planet, where uh, the liquid, uh, uh, where liquid water can be on the surface of the of the exoplanet. So uh, this means also that uh, probably. The exoplanets orbiting uh, M dwarfs are tidally locked, which means they have always the same face um, close to the um, to the star. Um, how how to say it? Uh, opposed to the star? Yep. I don't know. <laughs> um, and so uh, that's another problem for right. for for life. Let's say so. It it's it doesn't start very well for <laughs> for life on, on red dwarfs but right. uh, actually um other scientists um have found that after this phase which uh, is uh, the initial phase for for what i know of the red dwarf lives uh, after that the uv and the x-rays are very low for example and so this means that life if survived or the, if uh, the habitability conditions uh, were not lost during this first part, uh, life could evolve uh, afterwards. And then it could have actually plenty of time to evolve because uh, instead of uh, the... Um, they, they are... Uh, red dwarfs are the uh, longest living um, stars we know so far. So uh, there's plenty of time for for life to to evolve. And that's what you looked at. So I guess, you know, you're less interested in that first few 10s of millions of years, you're more interested in that last 10 trillion years of yes. the of the, of the red dwarf. And so and so let's talk about the experiment that you did. Well, uh Basically, we wanted to understand from an experimental point of view, not from a theoretical point of view, which is something that has been done already, uh, if oxygenic photosynthesis, which is a primary driver of, uh, of uh, life as we know it here on Earth, uh, can be possible also on planets orbiting these kind of stars. And this is not a trivial question because uh, oxygenic photosynthesis, uh, from what we know here in on Earth, 
who works uh, mostly with uh, visible light. And uh, this has to be expected somehow because uh, um, oxygenic photosynthetic organisms evolved under the sun spectra. And so uh, they evolved to utilize light from uh, 400 to 700 nanometers. But since M dwarfs are different from the sun in the fact that uh, they have uh, very little emission in the visible and uh, the highest irradiances in the far red and in the infrared, uh, this is uh, something that is quite different for an uh, oxygenic photosynthetic organism as we know on Earth. So it's not uh, guaranteed that it could be able to utilize that kind of uh, that kind of light. So what we have done was to test uh, cyanobacteria, which are the simplest and most adaptable oxygenic photosynthetic organisms we have here on Earth. Uh, we tested their survival and uh, acclimation to this uh, particular light spectrum. Um, and yeah, uh, sorry. So, so I mean, like when we think about this idea of a planet being in the habitable zone, it's a region around the star where liquid water can form, can be possible. But I guess the question that you're looking at is, is the the photons, just the raw photons that are coming from that sun, and you've got life on that planet that's attempting to absorb it and and create this this chain of life. Can it use it? Is there enough actual energy in those photons that the that the life can use as a basis for growth and and so on to create an ecosystem? Maybe not like what we have on Earth, but something else. So, so what did you find when you when you ran this experiment? Well, we, we found. Uh, of course, we couldn't do that with the actual star. It would have been uh, fantastic, but yeah, we yeah. we had to use, uh, of course, a simulator, uh, a light simulator, uh, which we developed uh, here in uh, in in the um, here in Padova, where where I work, and um, this uh, simulator is able to reproduce uh, more or less from 360 to 850 nanometers, the emission spectrum of the star. So using that, we, we uh, exposed our organisms and actually find out that uh, if you give the same amount of total uh, light intensity, so uh, the same amount of photons, but uh, distributed in a different way, so uh, as a, as an M dwarf spectrum or as a control solar spectrum, you actually uh, don't have much difference in the growth in the growth you can achieve, and this was quite interesting because uh, um, the cyanobacteria we used are of uh, two kinds. One kind is a, a type of cyanobacterium um, of which there are uh, very few, which can uh, utilize uh, only far red light in order to grow. So they can uh, um, actually they can use uh, um, the visible light as the others, but they can also grow using only far red light. And uh, these are particular cyanobacteria which uh, live in uh, niches on Earth, which are enriched in far red light. And uh, basically, we uh, decided to utilize these cyanobacteria because we thought that maybe they could have an advantage over other organisms because of the properties of the M dwarf light spectrum. And then we used the uh, other cyanobacteria, which instead can only use far red, um, visible light. And basically, we found that there was not so much difference hmm. in the growth of the two. And this is quite surprising, of course. So, so I mean, when I think about the, like the black body spectrum of a star, and you've got this nice curve, and I think with the sun, it centers around the green part of the spectrum. And so you, if you, with, a, with an M dwarf, you're pushing that spectrum over. So you've got a lot more in the infrared, mostly in the red, only a little bit sort of coming outside of that spectrum. And, and you found that not only the extreme cyanobacteria that's, that evolved to handle mostly far red light, but just regular cyanobacteria too, 
was perfectly and and I guess you know it could survive but did it thrive well uh, at least from what we saw even if we uh, gave them uh, very scarce uh, light because uh, we used uh, uh, a quantity of light which is uh, actually low very low um they they actually could use it uh quite efficiently <laughs> and um in particular uh we we had that uh, the cyanobacterium which is not able to utilize far red light could use the visible portion of the m dwarf light spectrum which is one third of the solar light spectrum and so th this is quite interesting so it's somehow it utilizing it uh, uh efficiently wow no i mean like i don't know whenever somebody tells me that cyanobacteria can do something amazing i'm not that impressed anymore i mean cyanobacteria has been tested outside the international space station and then brought back to earth and it thrives and even retested in Martian conditions and it thrives. I mean, it feels to me like there's nothing cyanobacteria can't do at this point. Um, <laughs> did you try any other forms of life beyond cyanobacteria? Any other photosynthesis yes. creatures? Uh, well, this is something we are, we are currently doing. Uh, actually, we are, uh, we will, uh, I think, in the next months, uh, publish something else about about this. But we are also trying. Uh, we are kind of uh, stepping um, more and more in the scale of evolution. We can say something like this, <laughs> um, and we are trying to understand also if more complex organisms can utilize these lights, this light proficiently. Um, but we suspect that uh, the the more uh, complex you go, uh, the less they will be able to utilize uh, such tiny amounts of light. Because uh, usually uh, microalgae or mosses or higher plants need uh, um, higher amounts of of uh, light to to grow proficiently, but it's not a given. There are also shade adapted plants and so on. So mm -hmm. it could be, we could find anything. I mean, right. I mean, I sort of think about walking in the forest and you see certain kinds of plants that are shade adapted, as you say, that can, that can handle very low light conditions. And in many cases, they're unhappy or they're out competed in better light conditions. So, so based on what you've seen with the cyanobacteria, are you kind of imagining an ecosystem that you might find on an M dwarf and how it might be different from an ecosystem that we find on Earth? Because it sounds like something like cyanobacteria can still thrive, but maybe larger plants can't. So maybe it has to eat the cyanobacteria to move up the chain as opposed uh, to trees. Of course, this is uh, highly speculative because uh, um, we looked at uh, oxygenic photosynthesis because it's uh, basically what we do in the in the laboratory. We are, um, I would say, uh, experts in uh, in oxygenic photosynthesis, and um, but uh, we could also have that uh, oxygenic photosynthesis doesn't evolve at all in a planet orbiting an M dwarf. So we could have something else. The problem is that oxygenic photosynthesis is uh, very efficient and uh, allows you to create a lot of biomass and uh, actually allow more complex life forms here on Earth to evolve. And so uh, oxygenic photosynthesis is the more or less the cause for all the complex life we see now so it's a good a good point to to start and uh, regarding what we could see there uh, actually life could be at least oxygenic life could be less different from what we have imagined so far at least for what we have seen in our experiments 
because uh, in the past, uh, in those uh, theoretical uh, um, papers in which they tried to understand how oxygenic photosynthesis could work under an Endorf uh, spectrum, uh, they had hypothesized like uh, uh, organisms uh, with uh, that could absorb light uh, on uh, more uh, on the peak uh, of emission of the star, so between 800 and 1,000 nanometers, performing anoxygenic photosynthesis or some kind of a strange oxygenic photosynthesis where uh, there are more photosystems, which are the complexes we, which um, are responsible for the electron transport and uh, the production, uh, the conversion of the uh, excitation energy into, into biomass. Um, that... Uh, forms of these photosystems which are um, more um, there are more of these photosystems so there there are quite a, a, a few hypotheses on how this could change on an m dwarf uh, scenario but from what we have seen actually we could have uh, uh, organisms which are very much uh, much similar to those on uh, to those on Earth, I mean, so you... at least uh, for the cyanobacteria and um, the the microorganisms, let's say. Right, like if you took the the test samples in your lab and just dropped them off on a planet around an M dwarf with liquid water on the surface, would they just get to work? I mean, uh, there are plenty of others uh, parameters that should be taken into consideration of course uh, if it if it was um, a terrestrial like exoplanets so the earth put orbiting around an M dwarf at the right distance to add the, a surface uh, su superficial liquid water I mean it could be because the light would be would be enough for mm -hmm. them. Uh, maybe they would grow slowly, but they could grow actually. Wow. So yeah, it would be possible. It, it, it is just amazing how <laughs> capable this organism is. Yeah. And it, you yeah, guys... indeed. It's it's every time it is uh, surprising the the adaptability. Of these uh, of these strains, it, it must yeah, be but... something just working with it and just knowing what it's it's like sort of respect for what this thing can do as you're as you're working with it. Yeah, yeah, we we have, but of course uh, these organisms are the the ones that evolved on a planet, uh, which is uh, Earth, which was actually an an exoplanet at at that time. They evolved uh, three point, uh, uh, well, yeah, I think three three billion years ago, and uh, there was no oxygen on Earth, so they evolved in a in a place which is which was completely inhospitable for uh, the current standards. So they they really did a a, a great job <laughs> in uh, yeah. making this planet uh, <laughs> habitable for us also. Yeah, yeah. Like if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't they be having this do. conversation. And they still do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so, you know, large telescopes like James Webb Space Telescope, like the upcoming extremely large telescope, these are going to be scanning the atmospheres of some of these planets around M dwarves, looking for some kind of trace gases in the atmosphere. Do you do you have any notes that you would pass on to the astronomers to say, look for this? Well, uh, it it would be nice. So for now, we we are still on the on the um, yeah experimental side. So we are trying different. Uh, 
different atmospheric compositions. Uh, we are trying to grow them in the in these uh, different light spectra. And what we hope to to obtain is uh, some kind of database of experimental conditions and environmental parameters, simulated environmental parameters, which uh, we could uh, uh, offer to the astrophysicist uh, to the astrophysicist community in order to um, distinguish between uh, uh, an atmosphere with oxygen produced by uh, abiotic sources or an atmosphere uh, uh, with oxygen produced by biotic sources uh, because the the point the problem is uh, is that um, you can find an atmosphere on a distant exoplanet. It's not so easy yet, but uh, it's something that uh, uh, will be done in the future. Uh, but the point is, uh, you you do not know if that oxygen can be produced by organisms or it is produced uh, by other uh, abiotic sources like the photodissociation or water or something like that. So we hope to give uh, um data in order to um kind of distinguish between mm -hmm. the two or at least to to help in distinguishing the two so to guide better the the discovery of uh, life on other planets now have you thought about other extreme examples of of planets like one example is say like a white dwarf like it's it's believed that perhaps <clears throat> planets can reform or migrate inward around a white dwarf and even end up in the habitable zone around a white dwarf have you thought about like what impact that might have on the habitability of a planet for life i mean uh we uh, actually i never thought about it um i would have uh, at least for oxygenic life, I will have to check yeah. what is the, let's say, the emission spectrum of the, of those uh, kind of stars and how much, how much light they they emit. But uh, I mean, uh, if they emit in the visible, uh, they could be, it could be used. Maybe mm -hmm. the light, maybe it would be uh, too little. I think uh, white dwarfs also have uh, emission of um, UV and X-rays. Could be. D depends on how old they are. Mm. So when they're very new, they're very hot and have some UV and X-rays, and then they <clears throat> they settle down over time and, and cool down to the background temperature of the universe. And then what about like the other end of the spectrum? Think about the stars that are a lot larger than the sun, ones that are pushing their photons into the blue and ultraviolet end of the spectrum. Do you know, how well does cyanobacteria handle uh, a lot of blue photons? Uh, actually, they do not handle uh, the, the blue photons very well. They prefer red photons as the majority of uh, the oxygenic photosynthetic organisms. But the problem there is that uh, those kind of stars, so the ones from uh, the O, B and a classes at least they all live uh, too little in order to to allow um, life to evolve so probably there could be uh, not enough time for this kind of life to evolve the the star would uh, would end its life uh, too quickly so but you're it, they could use it actually Oh, that's interesting. So they could use it, and then their star would they would they would evolve, and then their star would explode, and that would be, that would be that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be that would be the problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that you're already working on the next version of this, and of course, that was going to be my question. And and I think you are, you don't know the results yet, so I, I'm assuming you don't want to talk about them yet. When do you hope to complete this next round of tests with? some mystery plant uh well uh at least for a uh, preliminary uh for preliminary results we hope to have them by at least by the end of the year oh, great. maybe 
maybe sooner. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, I guess you have to work could, with the plant. You have to take the plant takes time to to show you yeah, whether yeah, it's working. It's, it's uh, it takes longer, but we yes, we hope to to get something out by the by the end of the year. And right. um, maybe something uh, that we, similar to what we have done uh, two years ago in the in the first paper paper we we produced about cyanobacteria, which was which were um, in which we uh, tested the survival of cyanobacteria on small uh, agar plates, so on solid medium. So these uh, those are the simplest and uh, quicker. Right. experiments you can do yeah. uh, of course if you want to do something more uh, specific like uh, to understand the acclimation and the organization of the photosynthetic apparatus and so on like we did in the last uh, in the last paper uh, it takes uh, it takes more time yeah and I guess my last question is is do you could you keep the experiment running and use like selection to adapt the organism to handle these conditions better and better with each generation yeah yeah it's uh, something uh, we would really like to do uh, of course uh, the the problem is that the simulator is uh, capable of handling a certain amount of uh, of samples and so Having to use it for for other organisms uh, or other experimentations, it's unfortunately we cannot leave, uh, uh, for example, strains of uh, cyanobacteria there to kind of evolve. It would be um, probably a long um, a long way to obtain an adaptation because uh, uh, this this is something that has been done. In other conditions and uh, with other parameters, for example, for bacteria, and it takes uh, a lot of time, like uh, a couple of years, maybe. And right. cyanobacteria take more time than bacteria to to grow, some of them at least. And so it would be a a very long uh, long time for for an adaptation, but it it could be done for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Mariana, it's absolutely fascinating. And please let me know when you've found out whether trees can grow on, on red dwarfs. <laughs> I will try. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at university.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to David Gilton and Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbeoff, Josh Schultz, and Andrew M. Gross, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.